This conference is brought to you by Coldstack, React and React Native development experts. Hello everyone, my name is Mark and welcome to my talk about Vision Camera and JSI. I will be splitting this talk into two parts. So in the first part, we're going to take a look at Vision Camera as a library and how you can use it in your app. And we're going to create a simple object detector app using frame processes. And the second part, I will go over how JSI works, what JSI really is, and how you can create a simple, fast and synchronous library using JSI. So let's get right to it. So I've created a new React Native project and installed Reanimated and Vision Camera. I've added some basic code to request for camera permission. So if the user has not granted permission, we're going to display that. And if there is no device available, we're going to show a loading indicator. Otherwise, we can display the camera. Let's take a look at how this looks for now. And as you can see, the camera is running fine. All right, we have our camera running. How do we implement an image label now? So let's first try to understand how this works in native apps. In a native iOS app, you have to create your camera session and then create a new instance of the AV Capture Video Data Output class. Then you can implement the Capture Output Delegate method, and this method gets called for every frame the camera sees. So for example, if your camera is running at 60 FPS, this function gets called 60 times a second with a new frame. In there, you can try to implement any sort of processing you want. You can use this for facial recognition, object detection, image labeling, QR code scanning, and even upload the frames to WebRTC to create a real-time video chat. On Android, this is basically the same story. You create a new image analyzer, and this image analyzer gets called with the new image every time the camera sees a new image. So for example, in here, you might want to run your image labeling, object detection, facial recognition, or WebRTC uploading. Okay, we now understand how it works in a native iOS or native Android app. But we're React Native developers, we're all afraid of native code. So how can we do this in JavaScript? Luckily, Vision Camera provides an API for this. It's called Frame Processes, so just click the Image Analyzer or the Capture Output Delegate from the native iOS and Android apps. This function gets called for every frame the camera sees. You can use the frame object to access frame data. For example, you can inspect the image's width or height properties. For high performance algorithms, you can also create native functions. So you write a few lines of native code and then directly call them inside a JavaScript frame processor. For example, the detect is hotdog function is a native function written in Objective C or Swift and Java or Kotlin. Let's take a look at how we can create a simple frame processor. We're going to create a new variable called frame processor, and we're going to use the use frame processor hook to create a new frame processor. Inside the use frame processor function, we have to use the work head directive. So let's add it. And let's just simply log something to the console every time a new frame arrives. All right, and let's add the frame processor to the camera. Let's hit save and test the change. In our console below, we can now see that a new frame arrives every time the frame processor gets called, which gets called every second per default. We can also adjust this behavior by passing frame processor FPS and pass some higher value, such as 10, which gets called 10 times a second. All right, let's start creating our first frame processor plugin. A frame processor plugin is a native function you can write in Objective-C or Swift or Java or Kotlin, and you can directly and synchronously call it from a frame processor. For example, if we create a native function that's called label image, we can call it like this. So to create the native function, let's go ahead and open the project in Xcode. All right, let's start implementing the plugin. We're going to create an interface and an implementation for the plugin. And then we're just going to create a static inline function, which is called every time you call the plugin. So for example, in this case, I'm calling it label image and the function receives a frame as well as any arguments passed to the function. We're going to export it to make it available in the Vision Camera runtime using the Vision Export Frame Processor macro. Let's go ahead and start implementing the label image algorithm. We're going to use MLKit for this, and MLKit has an API where we can label images. We need to add the library to our pod file and then run pod install. And then we're going to create an MLK Vision Image instance and assign an orientation. After we've created this, you have to create an MLK Image Label instance, which is responsible for labeling images. Then you can use the process image function to process an image. Let's try it. We're going to create an MLK image label instance, which is going to be a static instance we're going to reuse. 
And then we're going to create a new MNK vision image instance. We're going to initialize it with the frame buffer. As you can see here, we use the frame. And we're going to set the orientation to the frame orientation. Then we're going to scan for labels. In this case, we're using the results and image function, which is synchronous. Using the labels, we can now initialize a new array and fill in the labels. So in this case, we're creating an NS mutable array. I'm going to call it results. And then we're going to iterate over each label in this array and assign it to this array. Then we just return it. All right, that's it. That's all of the native code you need for a frame processor plugin. Let's go ahead and create the JavaScript side now. I'm going to create a new file called label image. In this file, I'm going to export a new function called label image. I have to use a workload directive so it can be called from the vision camera runtime. Then, as we learned earlier, the function now exists in the vision camera runtime prefixed with two underscores. So I'm just going to call it like this. And lastly, we need to add it to the bubble runtime. So open your bubble config and then find the line where the reanimated plugin is added. We just need to add a new configuration to it and pass it in as a global variable. That's all you need to do. Now restart your Metro Bundler, and you can simply call a function. We're going to import it. Now let's try just logging all image labels. So let's start the app and take a look. As you can see, the frame processor plugin gets called and we're logging all of the labels to the console. All right, now that we know how to use frame processes, let's take a look at how JSI works. We're going to create a simple JSI library, and afterwards we're going to look into more advanced examples, such as a JSI host object, and how Vision Camera uses JSI to provide all of this functionality. Let me start by explaining what JSI really is. I'm sure all of you already know that React Native uses a bridge for communication between JavaScript and Native. Since the JavaScript runtime runs in a very isolated context, there's not a lot of things you can do in it. Sure, you can create functions, create numbers, add numbers, create strings, create objects and stuff like that. But what if you wanted to access the device name or the phone's IP address? Those things are available through platform-specific APIs, so APIs written in Objective-C or Swift and Java. As with most programming languages out there, you cannot automatically and directly call into another programming language. There always has to be some sort of communication layer in between. For example, in Java, you can call into native C or C++ code using JNI, the Java native interface. To call C++ APIs in Swift, you have to manually create a bridge using C or Objective-C, which acts as a communication layer in between. In C Sharp, you have to reference the function's name and the DLL it lives in. So that's why the React Native bridge was invented. It provided a tunnel to send messages between native and JavaScript. If you wanted to find out the IP address, you have to send a message like get IP address to the native world. The native world receives that message, finds out the actual IP address, and then sends back another message with the IP address in it. JavaScript receives that message, and now JavaScript has a value which contains the IP address, which is a string. This is of course not an ideal solution, since the bridge uses a batching system, and the message is not immediately sent, but rather batched with other messages. At some later point in time, all of the messages are then sent to native. Also, there's a lot of serialization going on here, which is done in the JSON format. So you cannot send a number to the native function. It has to be converted to a string, a JSON, first. As you can imagine, that's really slow. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, since our JavaScript runtimes, JavaScript Core, Hermes V8, are written in C or C++, some very smart people invented a C++ API called JSI. JSI is an abstraction layer over virtually any JavaScript runtime. It works the same for JavaScript Core, for Hermes, for V8, and any other runtimes that might implement JSI. So if you know object-oriented programming, you can think of it like an interface, which is exactly what it is. It has functions defined, which the runtimes implement. For example, you can create a JavaScript number straight out of C++. Okay, but let's take a look at some actual code. So in JavaScript, we can create numbers by using the assignment operator. In this case, the variable number stores the value 42. Let's see how we can create this in C++. In C++, we use the JSI value constructor to create a new value called number, we can also use in C++, which holds the value 42. This variable can directly be passed to JavaScript either by passing it as a parameter or by setting it as a property on an object. Let's try creating a string. 
In JavaScript, we can again use the assignment operator and two quotes. In C++, we also have to define the encoding format. So in this case, it's UTF-8. And we have to pass the runtime. Again, the value name exists in the C++ word, so we can directly run some operations or functions on it. Now let's take a look at functions. Let's create a function which just adds two numbers together. We're going to call this function add. In JavaScript, we can again use the assignment operator and create an anonymous function. This function adds first and second together and returns the result. In C++, we have to create a JSI function, which creates a new function from the host function. A host function is a function which actually lives in the host environment, so in a native world. This function contains C++ code, but can be directly called from JavaScript. We have to pass a runtime, we have to pass a prop name, which will be add in our case. We have to specify the number of parameters, in this case it's two, the first and the second number. And then we can create a C++ lambda. And the lambda's first argument is the runtime. The second argument is the this value, so you can bind a function to another this value. The third argument is an array, a C-style array, of all arguments passed to the function. For example, on the first position there will be the first number, on the second position there will be the second number. And the count parameter specifies how many arguments were actually passed to the function. In our case this will be two. Then the lambda returns a JSI value. You always have to return a JSI value, and if you don't want to return anything, you have to return a JSI value of undefined. So in this case, we're casting the first argument to a number, then casting the second argument to a number, and add it all together. Then we return a new JSI value of the result. Numbers in JSI are always doubles. Let's try calling this function. In JavaScript, we will simply use add and pass two parameters. This function add can either be the one we created in JavaScript or the one we created in C++, the host function. We can call both of them synchronously. Let's try calling the same function from C++. Again, we have to have a reference to the add function and then we can simply use the call property to call the function. We have to pass the runtime and then all the variadic parameters we want to pass. So let's try adding this function to the global namespace. In JavaScript, we can simply use global.add and then use the assignment operator to assign this property. In C++, we can use runtime.global to get the global property and then we can use set property to set a new property. I won't go into detail about C++ memory management, but you have to move the add function because there's no copy operator for JSI values. So in this case, if we set the add function to the global namespace in the JavaScript runtime, we can directly call it in JavaScript, which we call the native host function from here. So if we compare this to a bridge module now, you notice that this function no longer has to be awaited. This function is completely synchronous, so the result returned in the host function can directly be used in JavaScript. This value holds the result we return here. To do this with a bridge function, we had to use await, which cannot be used in a top-level JavaScript code. So as you might have already noticed, this is the benefit of providing a direct, fast and synchronous access to the JavaScript runtime. If we go back to our IP address example, we can now create a function C++ that simply returns the IP address. We can then install this function in the JavaScript runtime's global property and then simply call this function. We don't have to use await anymore and the function is directly called just like any other JavaScript function. Also, there's no more serialization going on because as we learned earlier, all of the JavaScript values can be directly accessed in C++. So a JavaScript number can be directly used in C++ as a JSI value of type number. For our IP address, this would be a JSI value of type string. So let's take a look at the IP address example. We create a host function in C++, which simply gets the IP address from some platform-specific API, for example, from an Objective-C API, and then simply returns a JSI string, which contains the IP address. We move this function to the global namespace in JavaScript, and then in JavaScript, we can simply call it. So global now contains the get IP address function, which is a host function that exists in C++, and you can directly call it without using a wait. This is how you would install a native function into the JavaScript runtime. So let's quickly recap. JSI is a replacement for the bridge. While currently both the bridge and JSI exist in a React Native project, the bridge will soon be completely removed and every native module will use JSI under the hood. JSI is faster than the bridge and JSI is more powerful than the bridge by providing a direct access to the JavaScript runtime. With the bridge, the communication between JavaScript and native was asynchronous. Remember the batch message system? So this means you have to use a wait for every single function you call, even if that's an add function, which simply adds two numbers together. 
With JSI, everything is synchronous per default, so you can use it at top level JavaScript code. But don't worry, you can easily create promises to make something awaitable if it's a long running or an asynchronous task. Since JSI exists as the JavaScript runtime, it is no longer possible to use a remote debugger such as Google Chrome. Instead, you have to use Flipper. Remember, JSI is just a replacement for the bridge, so only the underlying technology changes. In most cases, you don't need to use JSI directly or even C++ at all. The Turbo Modules API will be almost the same as the Native Modules API. So this means for every Native Module that exists today, it will be very easy to migrate to Turbo Modules without rewriting the entire thing. Currently, there are three runtimes that implement JSI. JavaScript Core, which is the default runtime for now. Hermes, which might be the default runtime sometimes in the future. And V8. Also, JSI does not implement any sort of thread safety locking. While JSI is ready, it's a bit quirky to get access to the JavaScript runtime at the right point in time. There are a few hacks involved, I will show you now. We'll take a look at my React Native MMKD library, which provides a fast and easy storage solution for React Native using JSI. It's about 30 times faster than async storage, and it is a really good example for JSI, since you benefit from better performance, as well as synchronous access in top-level JavaScript code. Let's take a look at the project structure first. So compared to native bridge modules, there's currently no way to auto-link or automatically install a JSI module. Instead, we have to go into our main application, Java, find the React Native host instance we're creating, and then override the get JSI module package function. In this function, I'm going to return a new MMKB module package instance, which is a class that implements the JSI module package interface. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, the class implements the JSI module package interface and overrides the get JSI modules function. In this function, you can return a list of JSI module spec instances, but we just return an empty list. Why do we do this? Well, there's something special about this function. This function is actually called on the JavaScript thread. So since this function is called on the JavaScript thread, before the JavaScript bundle executes, we can quickly install the MMKD module into the global namespace. If we wanted to do that on another thread, for example in the native module thread, we would likely get an error at runtime and the app simply crashes. So let's take a look at how the install function works. We're going to open the MMKD module class, which is still a Java class. And as you can see, here's the install function, which takes a JavaScript context holder as a parameter, which is the JS context. This is a Java hybrid class, and it actually contains the JavaScript runtime as a C++ instance. But we cannot access this in Java right now, so let's take a look at how we can pass it to C++. We call the native install function, which is a JNI function. It's a native function that exists in C++, but you can directly call it from Java. This is the first time we cross languages. So in this case, we go from Java to C++. To implement the C++ function, we have to create a CMake and Gradle setup. I'm not going to go over this right now, but you can take a look at this at GitHub. So let's take a look at the native install function. This function exists in a C++ file. And as you can see here, it is prefixed with the full Java namespace. So the first parameter is the JNI environment. Then I'm going to get the class, which is the MMKD module. Then I'm going to get the first parameter, which is a long. In my case, this is the pointer to the JavaScript runtime. And then I'm getting a Java string to the path where MMKD stores all the documents. If we take a look at the Java function, this is exactly what we defined here. So now in the C++ file, I can now reinterpret the JavaScript runtime pointer to be an instance of the JSI runtime. So, and if the cast succeeded, we can now install the actual functions. If the cast didn't succeed, we're likely not in an environment that supports JSI. For example, if you use a different runtime than the three runtimes I listed earlier, or if you're using a Chrome debugger. So let's take a look at the install function. The install function receives a JSI runtime reference, and now you can use this reference to install variables into the global namespace. In this case, I'm installing the MMKD set function in the global namespace. So this is a JSI host function, as we saw earlier, which simply sets a value to the MMKD storage instance. As you can see, we can check the arguments for the types using is bool, is number, is string, and we can also throw JSI errors. At the end of the function, we always have to return a JSI value, and if we don't want to return any value at all, so no number, no string, no object, we can simply return undefined. And then here's the actual implementation for MMKD, where we simply set a value to the default MMKD instance. In this case, we're calling set and getting the value. If you want to convert the JSI value to a number, you can use as number and you get the returning double value. Same thing for booleans. And for strings, there's a JSI string wrapper. So as string, we'll return a JSI string. 
Of course, you can also convert the string to an actual C++ string, so an std string, using the .utfa function. So let's take another look at frame processes. Earlier, we saw that we can directly access a frame's width and height properties, and we can even directly pass it to a native frame processor plugin, which, by the way, is a host function. So how does this work? What exactly is the frame object? How does it contain a full 10 megabyte image from the camera? Isn't it really slow to copy frames from native to JavaScript for every frame the camera sees, which can happen up to 240 times a second? Well, there's actually no copy of serialization happening here. The frame parameter is actually a JSI host object. This means the object has been created in C++, but JavaScript can also interact with it, similar to how host functions work. So if I access frame.height, this actually resolves to the C++ code and calls get property on it. So let's take a look at the shape of the frame object. I've created simple TypeScript types for this, which don't contain any code or anything, but we can understand the shape better. So for example, for the frame, we have an is valid with height, bytes per row, planes count uh, properties, and then we have two functions, to string and close. All of these properties actually do not exist in JavaScript. They all exist in C++. Let's take a look at how we define the host object. So as you can see, this is the frame host object header. This is a C++ class, which inherits JSI host object. We can override those two methods to provide information for the JSI host object. So you cannot directly use the frame object in JavaScript because it's an objective C object and JavaScript doesn't know how to interact with it. Instead, we create a frame host object, which acts as an interaction layer between the JavaScript frame instance and the Objective-C frame object we stored here. So for example, if we call frame.height, the get function gets called with the name being height. And then we can simply access the frame with Objective-C code to find out the actual height of the frame and return it as a JSI value, a number. Let's take a look at the implementation. So the get property names function simply returns a list of all valid properties. This is useful if you want to use object.keys on the frame, which then returns all of these keys. So for example, two string is valid with height, bytes per row, planes count and close get returned. Then you can implement the get function, which acts as a getter. So if you call frame.height, which is not a function, it's simply a property getter, this function gets called with the name being height. In our case, we can then get the height using an Objective-C API from CM sample buffer. Then we can simply return the height as a double using the JSI value constructor. So for every time you try to access frame.height, this is not a value stored in JavaScript. Instead, this C++ code gets called. If you try to access some value that is not supported, you just return JSI value undefined. The same thing applies to the close and to string functions. For example, for the close function, we have to create a host function and then return the host function. So if you access frame.close, this function gets returned. So then if you try to actually call it, so two brackets, this function, which is a host function, gets called. As you can see, all of this exists in C++, and JavaScript only provides an interaction layer by using the host object instance. You can find all of this code online on GitHub at the Vision Camera repository. So let's start creating our own custom host object. I'm going to create a class in C++. I'm going to call it example host object, and we're going to inherit from JSI host object. Then we have to override the functions get and get property names. So in this case, we have to add get property names and override. The signature is always the same from JSI host object. And now we start by implementing get property names. You have to return a vector of all property names that you can access in the host object. This is useful if you want to access object.keys on the given object. So in our case, we're just going to add some value. In this case, you have to create a prop name ID and give it a string of some value. Now let's start implementing the get function. So now let's try to find out what the user actually wants to access. You can use name.utf8 to actually get an std string value for the past prop name ID. With the std string stored in the name variable, we can now work. Let's find out if the user actually tried to access some value. We simply compare name to some value, and if it's true, we can return some value. In this case, I'm going to return the lucky number 13, but you can also return an object, a string, a boolean, whatever. So let's look into some other value types. First, we can try returning a boolean. So if the property some bool is accessed, we simply return true. Next, let's try returning a string. If the value some string is accessed, we create a new string from a UTF-8 SCD string, in our case, hello. Let's try something more complex. We try to build an object with two values, some value and some bool. 
So we create a new object using the JSI object constructor. Then we can simply use set property to set some values. Some value is set to JSI value of 13. And some bool will have the property true. Then we can simply return the object. Let's try building an array. If the value sum array is accessed, we build an array with two elements inside. Since we already know the size of the array, we can simply pass it to the JSI array constructor. Now let's try inserting the values and simply returning them. Now in this case, this should be one instead of zero, but you get the idea. Now let's try creating another host object. Let's try creating a new instance of the example host object. So in this case, we're creating a new shared pointer of the example host object using the default constructor. And then we can use JSI object create from host object to create a new host object. Next, let's try creating a host function. Host functions look very complex at first, but in reality, they're really easy. So the first step is to create a C++ Lambda. You have a capture list of all values that get captured in the Lambda. And then you have four parameters, the runtime we're currently using, the this value of the function, if the function is bound to any specific this value, a C style array of all arguments, and a property defining how many arguments are actually passed. So how big the C array is. Then you return a JSI value, which is undefined if you don't want to return anything, or any other JSI value if you want to return something. In our case, let's just add the first and the second argument together. So it's a simple add function. We're getting the first argument as a number and adding the second argument as a number too. Then the result is a double. We can create a new JSI value from the double and return it. Now we still only have a C++ Lambda and not a JSI function yet. So to create a JSI function, you have to use the create from host function function. You have to pass the runtime and then you have to pass a prop name ID, which is in this case, just fun. And then you can specify the number of parameters that will get used for this function. In this case, it's two. We're expecting two, two parameters, the first and the second number. And then you simply pass in the C++ Lambda. In most cases, you want to move this. So SCD move. And then we simply return the function. Then you can also access the global namespace. So anything that's defined in a global namespace can be accessed by using runtime.global. For example, you might want to create a host function that can be called from JavaScript and it performs some asynchronous task on a new thread, such as uploading something to a server. To make it awaitable in the JavaScript world, you can create a new promise by accessing runtime.global, get property as function, and then simply get the promise property, which is a function. Remember, all constructors in JavaScript are simple functions. So then we call the promise constructor as a constructor, and then you have to pass in a JSI function, which is a host function, which then can resolve or reject the promise. This promise object can then be returned to JavaScript, and your code can execute inside the Lambda you passed in here. Then, as soon as your upload is complete on the other thread, you can simply call the resolver, and the code that is awaiting in JavaScript can then continue executing. There's also another JSI value type that's not directly included in the JSI implementation, and that's the array buffer. And ExpoGL implements this as a typed array, as you can see here. So if you have a large data buffer in the native code, converting it to a JSI array by looping over it and pushing element by element um, will probably make you hit an out of memory error or you're, or you're going to notice serious performance problems. Instead, you can use the typed array implementation to quickly make the buffer available to the JavaScript world. You create a new typed array by using one of the available typed array types, which are the sizes of the types. So 8-bit integer, 16-bit integer, 32-bit integer, and so on. And then return it to JS. This is faster because under the hood, only a simple mem copy operation happens, as opposed to looping over the entire thing and pushing a new JSI value into the array each time. And this is also more memory efficient because as we learned earlier, JSI values are always stored as stars, with the only exception being a typed array, so an array buffer. So if you're dealing with anything smaller than a 64-bit double, for example, a 32-bit integer, a 16-bit integer, or an 8-bit integer, the typed array implementation actually only allocates that amount of memory. So for example, for one double, you could actually allocate eight 8-bit eight integers. So this means if you have a one megabyte array of eight bit integers, this would actually be eight megabyte in size if you use a normal JSI array. With the typed array kind of type int eight array, it will stay at one megabyte. So now that we finally understand how JSI works, it's about time it's already dark outside, we can take a look at how Vision Camera uses JSI to provide the frame processor feature. First of all, why can we not use the bridge for this? There are multiple reasons for this. 
First, since the bridge sends messages in JSON format, we cannot pass the entire camera frame to JavaScript. That would be a 10 megabyte JSON for each frame, and it will simply not be fast enough to run this 30, 60, or even 240 times a second. Second, we would have to pass the JSON back to the native world for every time we want to call a frame processor plugin. This would be twice as slow with the bridge, since we go from native to JavaScript and then JavaScript back to native. But with JSI, this has almost no overhead at all. Third, all of this JSON conversion would be blocking the JavaScript thread, so any state updates, navigations, all re-renders would be blocked. With JSI, we can use reanimate this work that API to spawn a secondary JavaScript runtime and run all of this code in parallel and uninterrupted to the React.js runtime. So this is how the frame processor gets created. Inside the frame processor, we create a new instance of the jImage proxy host object, which is the frame, from the jImage proxy. Then we simply call the function, which is frame processor, by passing in the host object. I'm not going to go into much detail as to how the work that API from reanimated works. This is a topic for a whole other talk, but if you really want to know how it works, I highly recommend you to read the source code of reanimated. Basically, it uses JSI to copy all values captured in a function in a worklet, and then call that worklet function with the captured variables. This means all of the captured variables used inside the worklet are actually only copies of the original objects. So if you want to make changes to an object, you can't. It's frozen. Also, for the frame processor plugin API, the user can use Objective-C or Swift to write the frame processor plugin. To make this possible, I convert all of the JSI values to Objective-C or Swift values. For example, a JSI value of type number can be converted to an NS number. Same thing for JSI objects, which get converted to an NS dictionary, or a JSI array, which gets converted to an NS array. This of course also applies to the Android side, so any JSI value can be converted to a JNI value, so a Java Native Interface value. In this case, booleans, numbers, strings, and objects can be used, and for the arrays you use the native array implementations from Java. So that's about it for my talk today. If you want to learn more about JSI or worklets, I highly recommend you to check out the reanimated or vision camera codebase. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you have any questions, just DM me on there. Bye everyone!